Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Horasis Global Meeting. Uh, we are here joined with uh, Mr. Boyan Ivanchev, President of uh, Boyan Ivanchev Advisory from Bulgaria, and uh, Mr. Alexander Zelensky, Chairman of PayPugs Capital USA. And uh, we're supposed to be uh, also Mr. Rishi Mehra, Chief Executive Officer of Wishfin from India, but I think he's delayed for some reason. Hopefully he'll catch up and, uh, uh, and join us. My name is Abdulaziz al Bakr, Chairman and CEO of uh, BMT, Business Management Technology from Saudi Arabia. Uh, just to give an idea about Horasis for the people that are joining for the first time, it is founded and chaired by Mr. Uh, Dr. Frank uh, Jürgen Richter, and he, he is a very well-known person and respected, and I think he's loved all acro across all the continents, so it's very hard to find a person that has that kind of credibility uh, across all continents. Uh, Horasis Global, their aim is to explore and define, implement sustainable solutions to the most pressing issues concerning today's cor uh, corporations and societies. Uh, whether it's economic growth, innovation, migration, inequality, and by aiming to facilitate cooperation and knowledge uh, sharing between developed and emerging markets with the goal, the goal leading collaborative and sustainable growth for corporations and governments worldwide. With that said, uh, we are going to be talking today about the financial innovation fostering and new service mode. How new financial technologies, the fintech, are shaping services, how services are provided around the world, how we can ensure that they are easily accessible and deliver value and efficiency to all parts of the society, especially the poor. And we will be talking about some other parts of uh, the fintech. Uh, one, adv uh, one of the advantages is that the the people that are the panelists that are talking uh, have uh, practical experience and some of them have uh, achievements and they have uh, uh, let's say big names that are working in the fintech technology and rising stars like uh, Mr. Alexander Zelensky so uh, I will start by by asking uh, Mr. Boyan about fintech. Do you think that the fintech industry has matured yet or is it still in its early stages? So we'd like to, to hear from you about that uh, topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Aubacher. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and uh, Alex. And as I can see, there are two gentlemen active in the room, Mr. Srika Reddy and Matthew Crack. So welcome, everybody. Um, uh, Aziz, look, uh, mm, I spent many years in, in banking and financial industry. And uh, in my last private equity, we were among the first guys uh, who invested in a fintech in uh, Central uh, and uh, East Europe. It happened in 2010 when we uh, invested some money into the fintech company which uh, uh, which made the first mobile uh, payment platform in in Bulgaria and uh, 
among the first in Central and East Europe. Um, it's very difficult uh, when you are among the, the first rockets uh, to invest in such a companies because uh, when the market is not ready, uh, when the users are not ready for uh, such an innovations, uh, such fintech companies are burning cash like hell. And uh, uh, God bless you, Alex. Yes, sir, thank you. And uh, uh, if such a company is unable to raise another and uh, another ticket uh, for uh, for cash for to continue to develop uh, the product and, and attack the market, finally it can fail. Uh, now we are uh, 10 years after the, say, the beginning of fintech industry, or at least the beginning of fintech industry in, in, in Europe. And um, the figures are really impressive. Uh, say, uh, in the first quarter in 2021, uh, the fintech companies worldwide uh, worldwide raised some 23 billion US dollars and uh, around 600 uh, deals. At the same time, uh, this amount raised is nearly two times bigger than the, the amount raised for the last quarter of 2020. Uh, nearly the same is the story with the average ticket size. For the first quarter of 2021, 20, uh, the average ticket size uh, on the fintech market uh, uh, is, uh, say, $37 million, uh, uh, and again is two times bigger than, than in the, the fourth quarter on, of, of 2020. So, uh, going back to your very uh, important question whether uh, the market is already ma maturing. Uh, I would say uh, we are very near to the uh, to the highest point of this market. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, some investors are already trying to find the already located and working platform with uh, uh, with with clients so as a as a result uh, the ticket sizes are bigger uh, but somebody may say okay but also the deals are uh, 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 more than than the previous periods probably uh, uh, this is uh, fueled uh, additionally by the the COVID period, the coronavirus period. But if we will subtract the coronavirus period, to me, I think that we are already reaching the point where the fintech industry is already uh, maturing. But, yeah. Uh, that's from an investment point of view. As a technology point of view, what do you think, Alex? Do you think that we have, uh, sorry, Alexander, uh, uh, that technology-wise, is it still uh, is it mature, or are we still going to be see more seeing more innovation in this in the industry? I would say, in an overall example. Uh, fintech world in general is changing very, very rapidly. I would say that one idea which was original beginning of our road uh, is pivoting almost not every month, it's every week when we have different decisions which are impacting how we are going to in the future. And I would also say that from my own perspective and also from what we see in real industries, uh, it's all about collaboration, it's all about um, usage of different means of uh, communications like social media, more widely as it was before. It's all about <clears throat> managing your data which you can receive from 
your customers and also your corporation partners and also faster access to new markets and uh, also uh, pretty much about uh, availability of fintech services to new markets like through open banking or any other any other interface you can imagine for uh, for these services from also our side we can say that things which were um, done previously in let's say five to ten years ago and took let's say half year to year like getting to new market getting license or getting uh, new services uh, available to your customers now it can be done in manner of not months same week and mm-hmm. also is affecting very very rapidly how and what we are able to do what we are able to achieve uh, creates very interesting alliances and uh, so on and so on. So if before um, you have been uh, treated by all your local banks as competitor in terms of uh, providing new type of services uh, to your customers, then now they are looking for you as your corporation partner. But we can definitely see that we need to move from <clears throat> the economical principle of security to one uh, uh, fooled by an audience mentality where there is more than enough opportunity to go around this technology. Also, <clears throat> our technical expertise and the financial insight and experience of banks need to work together to achieve the shared goal of creating new generation financial services with a better end user interface, which is also one of different shaping things for fintech companies if we take uh, if we take how how they develop so in general i would say that it's pretty much uh, pretty much different from ways how it was done before i see that trend growing very very rapidly okay uh, uh, just to uh, to mention, we're uh, we're having an open discussion. We have some topics that we've agreed we will be touching, but we're, uh, it will be more uh, interactive. So, uh, Bo- uh, Boyan, you've uh, you've talked about some of the obstacles that has uh, for the startups of the fintechs, and most of the fintechs are startups. Most of them, they they start small. Only a few of them, a few that are known that have reached a financial maturity that are valued above uh, a few hundred million or billions. I think Plaid is the only one that is valued above a billion dollars and so on. Uh, Or them and a firm. Uh, but that's that's one of the obstacles, which is the financing of the fintechs. Another thing that you've mentioned, Alexander, which is the, the competition that you have from the banks rather than working and so on. And the financing, at the end, you're going to need a lot of financing and funding so that you can be able to uh, to do the marketing and get more customers because... If you're not able to get customers, then you're not going to be growing uh, easily. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons, and correct me if I'm wrong, that some banks started competing with the, with you in the venture capital, especially in the fintech industry, uh, investing in fintech companies. Is that correct? Alex, can you start you? Yeah. I would say you first. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, it's uh, a very, uh, uh, the situation is very interesting. Uh, please do not understand that, that I'm using uh, uh, kind of a uh, strong wording, but uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, fintech industry, uh, I would say uh, from the one side we had very angry people who are nearly libertarian communists 
who were hating bankers, banks, etc. Let's burst the system. Uh, we are better. We are cheaper, and etc. Uh, definitely, the say uh, financial investors or venture capitalists are not that type of uh, guys. But anyway, they just want to offer another way of doing banking or doing private banking or doing uh, life insurance or whatever. At the same time, uh, the banks are giant financial animals. And if somebody will think that they will lay down and wait uh, until they will be destroyed by fintechs, it's, it's, it cannot be true. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, giving again uh, the example of uh, uh, the mobile wallet we, we made in Bulgaria and Finally, uh, that fit fintech uh, failed, but it's uh, absolutely uh, great experience for me and absolutely great knowledge. Uh, so uh, when we made it, we faced a strong competition from the banking system. They were spreading against us uh, any kind of information, don't trust them. We are not going to make business with them, etc., etc. That was the first period. The second period across the Europe and uh, 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 US, Japan, the banking system didn't understood that the fintech companies are just faster and, uh, in many cases, smarter. So they started at certain points to acquire them, to buy them. Mm -hmm to implement their platforms in internet banking because uh, they, they, they were pushed by the fintechs to do that. So uh, market is very interesting, highly competitive. Uh, and uh, now uh, I can see that, uh, or I would say that my perception is that the banking system is going more towards to the uh, fintech industry and still they want to implement more and more new uh, um, uh, technical uh, technical uh, ideas from from the from the fintech so uh, this is already probably the so called maturing market for the fintech industry when banking system is trying to be also like a fintech industry. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander, would you like to add? I, I can also add that there is great examples in market when uh, even non-financial uh, companies uh, are going into this market and there is like even uh, in Baltics, I saw a couple of such cases in the last couple of months so there was one of cases where Estonian payment provider was acquired by none other as Opera, which is one of the leading browsers in the market. And then again, we got to question what what functionality is behind that decision. On one side, it's in the browser, which is used by third parts of the world. On the other side, even if they are thinking about getting to financial services, then there is a reason for that. Also, there is a lot of examples in Russia, in other markets, where banks are just seeing an opportunity to go to such fintech companies uh, into markets where they have lost customers, where they cannot provide such level of automation as they do in like, normal way. Um, there is a lot of potential cooperation. I know that BBVA in uh, Spain is very active in uh, fintech world as well. And also, there is like tons of such examples where banks are not considered as a threat, uh, threat to your company, but all vice versa as best friend. Uh, even in our own example, we are having licenses across the world in the United States, in the uh, UK, in Europe. But at the same time, for example, in Ukraine, we are uh, treated as a banking uh, service provider under another bank license, which again is very strange. From one side, we are competing with them. From other side, they saw a 
potential that in same time while they will uh, get let's say ten thousand customers, we can get to the point in a manner of weeks saying that, hey, here is banking platform, here is terms and conditions you need to apply, and here is the same application we use for the AROPK or other market. And from this perspective, I would say that um, definitely, definitely world is changing. We need to um, kind of not control, but uh, move on with a new approach to different services. And as I already talked at the beginning of our conversation, Things you do right now in phone was not possible to do. And even imagine like five years ago, ten years ago, your phone was able to just receive calls or receive messages. Now you can launch rockets through your mm-hmm. <laughs> and so on and so on. So I, well, I would say definitely, the uh, world is changing, and we need to really start thinking more globally and be less uh, stressed about uh, being only solution for local market in one or another country, but look wider to bigger public uh, audience. That's really um, what FinTech is all about. All, all services starting from crypto services, ending with uh, international card payment systems, uh, different transfer systems and others are getting us connected to different means. So like in previously, you were sending you know, same uh, information through Telegram and just sending uh, Telegram to your friend with horses like mm-hmm. 100 years ago. But now you can send money in a way as you send your SMS messages. That's definitely shows how and where we are changing. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, the, the regulations, when you want to expand, uh, your get regulations from one country to another is uh, is different. And uh, that that will cost the fintech company, the startup, to how to adopt and or to comply with these regulations. So that's a big issue. Did you face that when you were expanding uh, pay pods? I, I would say it was even more interesting. Uh, since our company was involved in a couple of international projects, we have been lucky to be in position to not only be first users with one or another identification technologies or helping different companies and on governmental level to implement different solutions which were not known before, let's say, face recognition in government services, which was uh, never heard before. Uh, now you can uh, create solutions where you can just go to government service, don't need to have any payment method with you, uh, just use your face as recognition uh, and access to your wallet, which again is uh, un- unexpected previously in terms of government uh, services. I would say that from one side, uh, we definitely see different uh, approaches from different regulators. Like <clears throat> what in the United States allows us to do things which are not even near possible in NATO. From other side, having one license in NATO gives you access to full markets of European Union, which again is very useful when you speak to let's say, global uh, general uh, IML regulation or to regulation how you identify your customers, etc., etc. Again, there is a lot of you know, governmental bodies which start to understand how that companies can change approach to different financial services. We have different spend, like, latest example, my colleagues were, <coughs> were onboarding today a company from Spanish box regime, which again, on one side, it's uh, kind of uh, controlled entity because it's under uh, regulators' uh, overview. But from other side, they are really not licensed in sense as normal bank would accept them. <clears throat> and then again, question: Who will serve such customer? Will it be your normal Santander or any other bank you, you can find? or it would be a company from, uh, let's say, UK, 
you can easily do that because for them, the same, same company as their own. So from that perspective, I would say that it's, it's, it, it, it's even better if you can get uh, in groups of um, such fintech companies or through some sort of fintech incubator because it gives you very fast, very access to one or another market or one or another uh, regulate to mm -hmm. uh, some of the some of the new models that are coming up and are coming out which is banking as a service uh, rather than SaaS we have SaaS and uh, the open banking platform which is the same thing so uh, and it's these are fintech companies that are giving modular base or uh, banks can use uh, these uh, technologies rather than the, the banks develop it what do you think about it mr boyer uh if i did understand well your question uh as is uh, uh, more and more I can see that uh, uh, banks are trying to integrate already existing fintech platforms. Uh, that was your question. Uh, there is a new model uh, which is called, uh, like example, uh, Plaid. Plaid, they provide... Uh, uh, they will be providing or they have started to provide it and also Sopra, another company, a Belgian company, they provide banking as a service, which means that all of the software technologies that you want as a bank or a financial institution, you can get it from them. You don't need to install, implement it. You can, uh, just like salesforce.com, it's, uh, it's a cloud-based, and you just subscribe for it as a bank, and everything is yours, the data and so on. These are some of the technology innovations that they are providing, uh, not B2C from fintech to customers, but from fintech to banks from fintech to financial services, because we have two sides of the fintech technology or the fintech market, which is one that is targeting the customers, another that is targeting banks or financial services or businesses, companies, like for payment solutions and so on. Have you uh, experienced any of, the, of these solutions like the bank as a service uh what i can see in the uh, fintech uh, industry is that uh, more and more uh, the existing fintech uh, platforms are copying and uh, replacing the banking services uh, the fintechs are not anymore just the payment platforms and payment systems, but they are uh, already offering uh, possibilities to buy any kind of uh, financial instrument uh, in just with three clicks or four clicks, whatever. They are offering the possibilities uh, customers to make uh, private banking with... Uh, 500 or 1,000 dollars, what was impossible years ago, because the real private banking uh, was starting, say, in, uh, with uh, at least uh, 50,000 uh, dollars. Through the fintech platforms, you can buy already any kind of uh, health insurance or uh, life insurance policy. Uh, and uh, at certain moment uh, of time, the uh, smart grid they have, the smart way of usage of uh, these fintech uh, platforms are making uh, 
banking system useless. However, as a, bo- a backbone, finally, on, on, on the backstage, there is a, still the SWIFT system. Still, SWIFT system is uh, uh, executing all, all existing payments uh, in the banking system and also in the uh, uh, fintech uh, industry. So, uh, that is why I do believe that uh, banking system per se will be trying more and more to use these platforms to buy them or to just uh, uh, use them as uh, external uh, services or uh, what you have in mind uh, banking as a as a service as a service at the same time uh, fintech platforms are uh, at the hands of uh, finally low income low income families uh, families which are um, not uh, f- very friendly invited into the banking system so uh, also these uh, fintech platforms are often offering uh, the same services nearly the same quality and same services like it's for the mid-income uh, uh, families and high net worth individuals. Uh, Mr. Alexander, have you encountered or uh, worked with any of uh, these B, uh, banking as a service or open banking platforms? We, we actually are one of them ourselves. <laughs> okay. so, so, I, I was waiting for the talk. Okay. Generally, approach is that also what, what I said in the beginning of our discussion that um, you know, we see very dramatic change in speeds of creating community services. That's also a reason why such providers exist. There is multiple of them, like the largest bank in Germany, um, UBVA, Spain, um, Silicon Valley Bank in the United States, uh, many, many more others like uh, Green Dot in the United States as well. And even now, our company originally created as just normal moment bank uh, for small income freelancers and also internationally um, traveling people. In the end of the day, we became um, directly same type banking as service provider which is not really right, maybe, name for us, since we are not a bank, but we are comp- uh, group companies with financial licenses. But that definitely helps us to get all our customers served faster through the same API, same approach that we really can deep dive into customers' uh, needs or customers' ideas. And also we are... Um, Right now, while we speak, we are working on launch of new uh, fintech uh, venture, which will be focusing on uh, directly accelerating of uh, companies which are already in stage that they are ready to start, but not yet having resources to do so. So we are very dramatically moving them from stage when they are only launching to stage where they are really operational, they have international recognition to all markets, etc., etc. So, with it being said, uh, I would say that definitely business models uh, should be uh, going not into competition, which is one of ways how banks are trying to uh, to compete with each other, but it's an opposite uh, to partnerships, uh, through partnerships to go and uh, have such collaborations between them and different sectors. That's also a way how we have grown uh, from like zero half a year ago into where we are right now. We have been able to acquire access to biggest markets out there, like United States, Europe, UK, in not years, in, in months time, because, because we have friends in this industry already, and try to find these win-win situations uh, where everyone gets some, some interest in, in the end of the day. The, the collaboration that you have done 
was by integrating your solution with them. Um, and it's a worst as well. So we, like example with Ukraine, we <clears throat> really were not thinking even of going to Ukraine, but if, if we saw a lot of uh, freelancers coming, developers, uh, marketing people coming from Ukraine and willing to use our services. Uh, in Europe, it's harder to do with a different reason, but when you say, hey, here is like 10,000 customers coming from Ukraine, maybe we should find local bank and start with them instead. Mm -hmm. so, and that saved us a, a little bit. Almost two years of time of flight something, and they even didn't charge us anything because they understand the potential of these customers. Because you came with the solution ready. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. And they have customer base. Very yeah. good. It's a win-win. It's a, a triple win. The customer, the consumer benefits from the new service you're providing. You come up with a new solution, and the bank has the customer base, and uh, they they share with you the profit, and they keep their customers. They don't lose them to another com uh, competition. That kind of attitude, actually, and that approach is a very good approach, looking to collab collaborate and so on. I think that's that's a very good uh, way of doing it, and uh, a wise way, uh, rather than, uh, as they say, if you can't uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So that's one way of getting it. Well. Partly, partly I would say that, like, also all developments and all ideas that you imagine now, it's much, much easier to realize them as you have been doing that a couple of years ago, because technology, as we already discussed, technologies are growing, um, the technological stack and possibilities are out there, you just need to go in and find these good situations, because then, practical manner, they also are just people which tries to make their lives better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when they talk about like the IMF, the World Bank, and a lot of organizations, when they talk about fintech, they and everybody, all the expectation is that fintech will. Uh, deliver value to the unbanked uh, and uh, uh, there is a few billion people that don't have bank accounts or cannot uh, how how will fintech help them is it just because by providing the the software or is it providing the service uh, make it cheaper with the lower entry with a uh, easier entry to open accounts rather than banks. Boyan? Sorry, Alex? Yeah, I will allow a colleague to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, probably that is the only way uh, these uh, poor people to be included in a quasi-banking system. Uh, so it's uh, definitely for good because they can take uh, some micro credits and open a, a very small business, uh, say in Asia countries or uh, in Africa countries. Uh, I can see the only one weakness but this is, I would say, not the weakness of uh, the fintech as a such per se. This is a inherent weakness of human beings because we are uh, predominantly rational. And uh, predominantly poor people are with very low financial literacy. And when we can, when we offer to uh, people with very low literacy, uh, powerful instrument to take $1,000 as a credit or $5,000 as a credit, uh, they may uh, immediately go and buy a smartphone 
not to start a business. Uh, they may go just to spend them uh, $2,000 for a latest model of uh, smartphone and this is useless. Uh,